Thanks, Doug. Um, we're in the middle of the avalanche universe right here in Bozeman. We're very fortunate that to have such an interest in avalanche related goings on and uh, there's no place like this town for uh, active interest in snow related matters. I think that Montana State University starting with Charles Bradley and John Montaigne initiated this um, fine atmosphere here and we're here to carry that on. I'm honored to be invited today. I uh, starting with a photograph of a machine gun at Tuckerman's Ravine. This was my first exposure to avalanche control work in 1960. But I had uh, been fortunate to have entered Oregon State College in Corvallis in 1958 and I, and I fell into a group of people that influenced me for the, really for the rest of my life. Um, Willie Unseld was the advisor for the Oregon State Mountain Club at the time and I took some uh, two courses from him, theology and philosophy, and then joined Willie and sometimes Jolene, his wife, out on the, uh, in Rooster Rock uh, with some climbing. He was a, a major influence, as was Steve Roper, Oregon State Mountain Club. Um, Steve is a big wall Yosemite climber and author. Uh, that was fortunate. These people were influencing me. Chuck Hollister was a member of the Oregon State Mountain Club at the time and uh, later became president of the American Alpine Club. Art Judson, uh, who I'm in almost weekly contact with still, uh, became a close friend. And finally, Pat Callis, who's noted as a chemistry professor here at MSU, among other things, including active um, development of the highlight ice climbing area and uh, search and rescue person. 1958. Um, in 1959, I took a, a Circle A avalanche course. Circle A was the, was the basic avalanche course by the National Ski Patrol system and uh, at Hoodoo Bowl. Hoodoo Bowl didn't really have any avalanches, at least not in area. But when I was kicked out of forestry school there at, MS, or at Oregon State, um, Judson suggested I come back to Colorado and I fell into the, uh, into the mentorship of person by the name of Dick Stillman. And Stillman, at the time, I thought he taught me 90% of what I knew. I, this was maybe 15, 20 years ago, I was reflecting on Stillman's impact on my, my uh, learning. Uh, I gave him maybe more credit than I should have. I'm not sure that you ever learn 100% about avalanches, and to say someone gives you a certain percentage of your knowledge is perhaps an exaggeration. Uh, later, I fell under the tutelage of Ed LaChapelle. Um, between the two of them, they gave me probably 50% each of the 75% that I think I know about avalanches. The other 25%, none of us will ever quite figure it out. At any rate, Tuckerman's Ravine with a machine gun being used to shoot down the icicles in 1960. Um, I went back there because Tuckerman's was such a legendary place in the spring of 1960. I said, I just have to go back there. If you're any kind of a skier, you're supposed to be able to ski at Tuckerman's Ravine. 
And uh, we did. I skied the Hellman's Highway, which a couple of times to the left there. The other last time I skied it twice that day, I went out, went around the corner, and uh, started to climb up that other Kubar, which was a uh, slot, which was right in the headwall. And uh, there's Hellman's. And <clears throat> I got knocked off my feet by an avalanche that was triggered from above by somebody. I learned at that point in time to always look uphill when you're approaching an intersection. And uh, I was carried down on top of this wet snow debris uh, to a place called Lunch Rock where everybody was cheering and laughing. That was my first real avalanche experience. My second real avalanche experience would come later um, at Berthoud Pass. I got a job there as their ski patrol director. Um, you really only directed yourself because that's, I was working only on the weekdays. On the weekends, it would be the national ski patrol system and I would have the days off. But there's my mentor, Dick Stillman, who showed me much of what I know. The 50% of the 75% um, came from Dick. I worked there in 1960, 61, and then again in 61, 62. The second avalanche, and I might say the, the second and last avalanche I was involved in was this one. I call it the PBR avalanche, post-blast release. And that came from the explosive hand charge that we'd plopped into there. And I went down to stand in the crater to look at what the snow structure was. I figured it was a cheap pit um, to dig and then the avalanche released after this blast. And I was standing in a six foot deep bomb crater. It carried me through those trees right up the hill and into the debris. And I was fortunate that, and swam like hell, like I was taught to do, supposedly. Um, I, my head and shoulders were out in the biggest thing that scared me was the uh, approach of my rescuers that I was afraid were going to decapitate me as I was in the debris and all I could see was ski tips headed in my direction. Um, that was the second and last avalanche that I've been involved in and I think some of it was pure luck. A lot of it was that I am a very risk adverse person. Um, there's another shot of Berthoud Pass um, showing the size of the avalanches that we could get from there um, and the uh, we'd toss them off the lift and of course they would <laughs> run to the base. You could, there's an absence of ski tracks. There was no grooming in those days. There was um, this was really a, a great area to learn to ski in, but wow, um, the avalanche potential there was amazing. Is that the trough or the roll? Or the roll is to the right. Um, this is the trough, and the uh, I can't think of the name of the run to the. Oh no, this is the lift gully. Is the uh, is where this avalanche initiated? That's about a twelve foot high fracture line, by the way. And uh, the roll is off to your right, trough is off to the left, and then the uh, timber south of the trough was the avalanche I got caught in. Uh, Bertha is no more, unfortunately, but it's a great place to ski, and uh, this is skied frequently from people climbing from the highway. There's no avalanche control there now. There's a bunch of signs, but that's about it. There's my second mentor, and my second and a half mentor is standing right behind him, Rod Newcomb, and uh, Ed LaChapelle gazing into the pit. Um, this is after um, I'd spent some time at Crested Butte, and Rod and I 
were invited to come down and uh, be research assistants for the San Juan Avalanche Project, which was initiated by the University of Colorado Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research. Ed LaChapelle was our principal science consultant and took us under his wing. That's a RAM penetrometer, that post that's sticking up there just behind Ed. We're looking at the stratigraphy of the fracture line um, after the avalanche ran. And we had a, <clears throat> our protocols really for this avalanche project was mostly to look at fracture line profiles and do our, our pit work in study plots. And part of this philosophy was that if you did your profile in active avalanche paths above the highway, which is Highway 550 and several other adjacent roads, um, you could trigger an avalanche down onto a highway. And we didn't want to do that. But we did want to learn as much about the stratigraphy of the snow as possible. This is a pack howitzer being used by the Colorado Department of Transportation uh, to control avalanches. This was a, a, um, a vintage weapon, 75 millimeters, fired by the Department of Transportation at starting zones of avalanches. It's called a pack howitzer because you could dismantle this howitzer and put it on the back of mules for travel with the 10th Mountain Division during World War II. It's a, it's a vestige, it's an artifact. The only place they're used now is um, for ceremonial purposes in uh, Washington, D.C., to my knowledge. In fact, actually, they're starting to use 105s back in the courtyard of the Capitol building for the ceremonies. So the pack howitzer is, is, uh, has gone from the scene. The closest call I ever had, I feel, was with this avalanche cement fill on Red Mountain Pass. Um, I had uh, was driving the truck with the headlights on in the back there and came upon this um, avalanche at the same time the avalanche almost came upon me. Um, there was a the truck got nudged. Um, I was enveloped in snow and such and was able to back away from there and there was a natural avalanche event that occurred so my got caught in two avalanches and almost um, caught by a third this is a snow pit on wolf creek pass giving you some idea of the depth of snow that we were investigating um, while on this uh, San Juan Avalanche Project. We used RAM penetrometers, density tubes, thermometers, and occasionally came across a mid-pack weak layer, such as this surface for 70 centimeters above ground level. We um, <laughs> developed our own um, profiles. Uh, there was no such thing as, as automation or um, technology in those days. You did it yourself. Um, the, uh, I don't know if this thing points. Is there a... Huh. Density. Temperature. Ram. Profile and <clears throat> the avalanche profile itself. It was very important. We did dozens, probably hundreds, of these profiles. Rod Newcomb, Richard Armstrong, who was there, myself, um, we were intent on learning about snow structure and stratigraphy. You can see at the uh, bottom here is depth floor. The initiation of the avalanche was 
at this weak point in the snowpack here. Notice by week it also there was an anomalous um, density measurement at this point and the sliding surface was medium hard. The softer snow above that um, was softer and it initiated at this point. We don't really know where it initiated because this is just a simple sample uh, of a much broader avalanche fracture line. It did this in 77 at the Pallavicini uh, slide. This is an artificial hard slab, artificial ski, size 3 that went to ground. And uh, actually I was doing this when I was working for the uh, Colorado Avalanche Warning Center, which was a Forest Service operation at the time. Person on the left is Pete Martinelli. Person in the middle there in the blue shirt is Andre Roque. He came from Europe to participate in this Snow in Motion conference that was convened in 1979, spring of 79, to, um, by the Forest Service to highlight both the research that we were doing there at Fort Collins and also the work that others were doing throughout the North America and Europe. The person in the red striped rugby shirt there is Knox Williams. Knox came on board with the Forest Service in 1973 to start the first avalanche warning center, is what we called it. At that time it was the U.S. Forest Service sponsored at the Forest Range and Experiment Station. And I'm the semi-neophyte off to the right there. Um, we had a great four days of conference and then we drove around Colorado looking at the hot spots for avalanches. This is the Goat Lake Bridge avalanche in 1979, a natural avalanche that ran into the Stevens Canyon, middle fork of the Flathead River, east of Essex, Montana. Pete and I went up to look at this, um, and uh, it took out the, the Goat Lake Bridge, that's the, the uh, highway bridge there, deposited it down on the, in, to the trees. I think it's probably still there. Uh, right into that area. This is the Burlington Northern Santa Fe <coughs> Rail Corridor that runs through the um, south boundary of uh, Glacier National Park. And this is Bird Hill in Alaska, Girdwood, familiar ground to Dave here in the audience and others. Um, the highway uh, runs through here and up the hill, and the railroad is right at Tidewater there on Turnigan Arm. Dave will be explaining this a little further. This was a whoops, however, uh, for the railroad at the time. This is in 1980 with the uh, release of, uh, in a, as a wet slide, the um, Whiskey Avalanche Path that uh, sort of tied in, uh, <coughs> in its uh, approach to the, uh, to the rail and to the highway, which is up above here. Um, this was a potentially very serious accident. Um, it was a very serious accident. However, nobody was, was injured other than their pride, and it initiated a um, review of, of many of their protocols, which Dave will go into later. Whoops, same slide up on the highway. Uh, the person driving this car was fortunate to be able to put down the window, climb out of the car and from the slowly moving debris, and back onto the highway without 
um, <laughs> without injury. Uh, there was injury in this avalanche. And uh, I will say right off the bat, it was a moose. It was not a human. Um, this moose was caught in the slide at, uh, up at Round Portage in Alaska. On, uh, it was only partially buried. We came across this moose as we were looking at the runout zone of this slide, big avalanche. And uh, the moose was there, uh, young bull. It took us about a day to, uh, for everyone to, including the highway guys, to chip in and shovel this moose out. But unfortunately, it had a broken leg and we were able to um, divvy up the meat and uh, eat moose for much of the rest of the winter. It was, um, the moose unfortunately um, was dead. Uh, after we got through with it. <laughs> I went from Alaska um, back to Colorado and uh, thinking that I would return to Alaska, but when I was basking on a rock beside the Dolores River um, on a river trip in the sunshine, I said I'd rather be in Colorado. And I left the opportunity to remain in Alaska uh, and ended up in Wyoming. Uh, Rod Newcomb set me up with this position. We got an avalanche, we have a drill rig, we have about six avalanche paths that come down onto this site. And uh, we were very cautious in our exercise of the control program here since we had to shoot over the man camp and the facility itself. We outfitted everyone in the camp with old Raymer, bind, uh, <laughs> I say Raymer bindings, old Raymer avalanche beacons. We had rescue drills, we had shovels positioned here, and we had everything but a big winter, which was very fortunate because we had less than a dozen control missions and moved on away from that. But I got the avalanche and uh, the Sun Oil was kind enough to provide me with an extra bonus, which I mounted in the back of my truck, um, even though I had a stopwatch sticker on the back of the truck, I uh, still was, was armed and dangerous. Um, <laughs> used this avalanche uh, for a number of winters afterwards, either leasing it or actually doing the control work myself. It wasn't always logistically easy to uh, stage the avalanche at the international speed skiing site. That was where we were. We spent three winters, well, two winters and one avalanche mission to begin with at this site. Um, my snowmobiling experience was often um, behind the camera <laughs> while my friend Chris George was digging out the old ski do Alpine. But there was the avalanche, and there was the avalanche. Uh, international speed skiing, we uh, controlled that, and uh, it was a hard slab. Wiped out the speed skiing course, which was essentially up there to down here. Um, it, it, that's where it was intended to be. Uh, note the uh, dust um, band there in the hard slab, uh, very indicative of what's to come in a dry year with in the southwestern part of the San Juan Mountains in Colorado, dust on snow. We did have good success though. Um, the next two years this was, we'd go up with a, and do helicopter and avalanche control of this speed skiing area, which incidentally is adjacent to the uh, present Silverton Mountain ski area in a place called Velocity Basin. We actually got the board on geographic names to, to uh, name the mountain there, Velocity Peak. And you can see 
Velocity Peak and the speed skiing site. That avalanche debris from, uh, from the winter's worth of avalanche control there formed a perfect high density base for developing a speed skiing course. And speed skiing is essentially a straight down. It's, it's a figure 11 kind of race. And uh, one person at a time uh, on a well-groomed course and the grooming we could do with machinery of avalanche debris was just amazing. We could have the bottom of a course mapped out just bomb proof. And there it is. There's the course in 1983. And this might be 82, I'm not sure. Start there. Timing trap. Finish here. 129 miles an hour was the record that was set there by Franz Weber. Um, pretty good skiing. You can see off tracks off to the left here. It was quite an experience. Unfortunately, the logistics to do this, it was still a mile and a half in from the end of the road. So helicopters and snow cats and walking and skis and everything we had to use to get in there. We worked on it all winter long to make sure that when we had the one week of the event, there were no avalanches um, or no avalanche potential coming off of those cliffs. Not so with this. This was a tragic avalanche, natural, outrun condominiums in Crested Butte. A youngster who was playing in the snow was found there, uh, deceased. Two others were caught. They were waiting for a bus um, with their parents to leave after a week of skiing. Um, natural hard slab avalanche that came into a poorly located facility. There it is from, the, from across the way. You can see the avalanche started here, came down, ran into the outrun condominiums at that point. When I was going through this, I'm not sure why I put this photo in. Um, it's my dog. <laughs> He's a little cautious about standing on a cornice. Um, it, it, it may be the segue into, into something that I really believed in. I, I, I don't believe in, in risk exposure. I believe in risk mitigation. That's why I uh, stood behind the Avalancher and the 105 and so on for so many years was to try to control, in quotes, uh, these avalanches rather than exposing myself to them. I only got caught in two avalanches, and you saw each of those. Um, Mount Emmons and, and Crested Butte were about to ski the wonderful corn snow below these cornices, uh, 3,000 vertical feet down to Crested Butte. I've only put this one in to sort of advertise for Silverton, Colorado. If you're lucky and you're driving down Main Street right after a big storm and you have your camera in it and your window is down, you can get a picture of a natural avalanche in motion. Idaho Gulch. The preferred way is to use a artillery, however. Colorado Department of Highways, this is a 106. Um, which was later embargoed for use, uh, long story. We use 105 howitzers down there now. And this would be the results occasionally of, this actually was from a helicopter bombing from uh, Mike Friedman on the Camp Bird Road above Uray. There's Chris George, barely see him, standing in the bed of my truck with the avalanche debris which had been opened up by the mine group before. These things ran pretty big down there. This is the water hole slide on the Camp Bird Road. Not so actively controlled anymore. Helicopter bombing, 
that line. This is back on the speed ski site. You can see the the slab releasing in response to the detonation of the bomb that we dropped from the helicopter. Um, there's lots of these slab release photographs coming on now more and more. We we didn't have any GoPros in those days. You just talk the pilot into, into going back over the thing and hope that it didn't blow up in front of you and uh, get the picture when it runs. <laughs> this particular slide, Bert Metcalf was flying us. Bert said, boy, I wonder if I can outrun this thing. And he turned the helicopter on its nose and took off straight down the hill behind this avalanche and uh, he couldn't outrun it. It actually, uh, the avalanche itself was probably going 150 miles an hour. We were going 120. And another illustration of a hard slab in motion. This was up on Mosquito Pass in Colorado, getting a road open early in the season uh, for a mining operation, although we were doing this on behalf of the county. You can see the bomb crater here, bed surface, slab, intact, interestingly enough. The fracture line probably four to five feet deep. And uh, it was really a, a nice illustration of how cohesive hard slab avalanches can be at their initiation. Ah, and there's the crew. This is the center of the universe crew. And, and uh, the year 2000 for the development of the um, ISSW International Snow Science Workshop at Big Sky. And there's a, I want to point out specifically John Montaigne here as a mentor to many of us in this room. I guess my lesson about being adverse to risk is to just ski in the spring on the spring corn. Um, I started doing this a long time ago. This is 1960 at Mount Shasta. Uh, we climbed up above the ski area another couple thousand feet, had about a 5,000 foot run on just extraordinary, wonderful spring snow, no avalanche hazard. And finally, spring skiing in the San Juans. I just wanted to make a few comments about um, sort of the state of avalanche information and education. Uh, 50 years ago, I looked this, uh, Google's amazing, I looked it up. Um, 50 years ago, there were 100 and 80 million people in the United States, 1960. Now, 2015, there's 325 million people in the U.S. Now, that may not relate very much to avalanche uh, education, but in those days there were no avalanche centers. Um, now there are 21 avalanche centers, at least I counted on the avalanche.org website. 21 avalanche centers in 2015. Back in 1960, there may have been a half a dozen National Ski Patrol instructors. Um, there were significant avalanche, was significant avalanche knowledge with Dick Stillman and La Chapelle and a few others around the West, but their knowledge uh, was not being spread to the average skier, if there was such a thing as an average skier. Now there are hundreds of instructors for various schools. The importance of these few mentors that I had early on uh, to my education, my knowledge was, was invaluable. Um, now everyone has the opportunity to avail themselves of the widespread knowledge, including that of MSU. My main goal um, 
over my career was risk mitigation. And this is risk mitigation primarily through closure, closure of highways, and forecasting and explosive control. Um, the risk recognition from that of a 25-year-old when I was 25 might have been enhanced by my participation in search and rescue uh, missions where I saw the, I worked some for the Park Service in those days, uh, where I saw the results of um, extending your capabilities beyond that of your risk tolerance. In other words, people that fell off of things and people that were later, people that were buried in avalanches. And I think the direct um, exposure to search and rescue tensions and search and rescue and recoveries, uh, usually in my case, not rescues, but recoveries, um, really made an impression to me about risk and uh, willingness to survive. Uh, for risk avoidance, um, it's spring skiing to me is risk avoidance. Used to ski the steep and the deep, but got over that pretty quickly. So I stand at the bottom of the avalanche pass and look up and uh, as you can see this avalanche path has already run. I feel quite safe uh, standing there. But I don't know, the, the, I sort of pondered this question last night of the value of, of uh, approaching risk as a necessary element of life. I mean, how can you live a full and exciting life without some risk? And I think that's the balance that uh, we all try to achieve and, and to educate others to try to achieve. So that's the end of my presentation. I don't know how to turn this thing off. Yes, I do. <laughs>